Welcome to the Mind Vine Podcast, where we challenge the stigma associated with mental illness through conversations about a variety of issues impacting mental health. Here we bring you news, views, and interviews that intrigue, educate, and celebrate recovery. Leading us on this journey are the hosts of the Mind Vine Podcast, Daryl Mathers and Chris Bovey. Welcome to the Mind Vine Podcast. My name is Daryl Mathers. I'm with my co host, Chris Bovey, live on, it looks like, on the side of his house in Curtis, Ontario. And 40 degree weather on the deck in the back. Yeah. yeah. Actually, I can, I can see you sweating. It's great for people that will be listening to the podcast. They don't have to listen to the sweat on the outside of your, <laughs> outside of your house. How have you, uh, besides cranking up your air conditioner, what have you been doing to you? stay cool well we've we've i think it more it's kind of with the stage opening we've kind of changed some things so our oldest daughter is back doing work one day a week and we actually enjoyed a patio for the first time a trellised off socially yeah. distance acceptable patio so uh, it's slowly we're kind of you know using common sense but it's nice to sort of introduce little things here and there that kind of return to normal how about you yeah it's been nice to look forward to things. That's what I was saying. We just got back from vacation and camping. We've got a few more things planned for later in the summer. Uh, but it's just nice to think, okay, in a couple of weeks we're going somewhere, we're doing something. Because uh, before that, March, April, May, it was just like, oh, we have, like, mm-hmm. everything's been canceled. We can't go anywhere. And at least with this stage, I think just the idea of being able to do something has, has, uh, has helped us kind of manage everything mm-hmm. and we're going to mandatory masking starting this week yeah, story, right. so we'll see how that goes over i think i think most people get it i think there's still sort of some of those that you know feel they want to challenge this as their right not to wear a mask but hopefully hopefully everybody does the right thing as we move forward so we can start to reopen stores. Yeah, you're seeing more i was actually surprised going through a bit of ontario last week um you know you're seeing more and more people do it and and I, I do it for my mom. I, you know, like I don't really feel like I'm in, you know, in one of those areas where I'm too at risk and you are my children. But you know, my mom's, my mom's in that group, mm-hmm. and she wants this to be over as soon as possible. Right? Sure. So if we all kind of just take that step and and you know put on a put on a damn mask, then this <laughs> should be over. Um, you know, sooner. Yeah, or later. and I think it's just a signal that. that wearing one and doing that even if you have different views of it it just says i care about other people other than just myself and that it's it's really such a small thing to have to do it's only indoors when you go out to stores or shopping and things like that or whatever indoor places so i think it's a small when you consider people have lost their businesses that lost their income some people have lost loved ones it really is a small thing that we can all do together one of the things that's been uh, interesting about the pandemic is, you know, I'm watching all the, the same TV uh, all the time, the same <laughs> same program, CNN, CTV, and CTV is where I discovered what our next guest was up to. Um, pleased to welcome author Wesley King to Mindvine Podcast. Wesley, I noticed him uh, a couple weeks ago on Your Morning uh, on CTV and uh, promoting his new book, and thought. Be great to have him on. So, Wesley, welcome. Thanks for having me. So, what? How would your? We'll get into your book and your kind of story a a little bit. I mean, you've written several books. Uh, Sarah and the Search for Normal is your most uh, recent one. But before we we go there, how have you been dealing with this whole thing from your uh, in your neck of the woods, uh, Nova Scotia? Yeah, it's it's certainly been. It's been a bizarre year. It's been, you know, frankly, an awful year, too. You know, it started out um, with a personal tragedy in January that sort of affected a lot of what I was doing this year as well that led into um, this, the whole world sort of changing as well. Um, in terms of a strictly coronavirus sense, Nova Scotia's, you know, done remarkably well. We've, we've been somewhat immune from the worst effects of it out here. We're currently running, you know, at zero cases and have been for a few weeks. And so there wasn't a huge change here. Culturally, there's, you know, I'm not sure it's a good thing, but, you know, no one's wearing masks. No one's social distancing anymore. They've sort of moved on in the East Coast, it seems, 
apart from closing their borders and, and hoping not to let anybody else in, I guess. It's, it's, <laughs> there, it, it seems to be the philosophy right here. You know, the pubs had lineups the uh, moment they opened a few weeks ago again. So uh, people seem to have moved on there. For a writer, you know, it, it, you know, trying to find any gift in disguise, but I completed three books over the course of the, the shutdown because you could, I couldn't leave, you know. You could just sit on my work. So uh, it was a remarkably productive time, and, and thankfully, you know, no – no personal hits in terms of someone being, you know, diagnosed or anything like that. So relatively lucky. Uh, Wes, I want to start off with uh, one of your previous books, O.C. Daniel. Uh, shout out to the Whippy Wildcats, and if anybody's uh, watching. Yeah. <laughs> but but um, because the protagonist is based on your life growing up, I just wonder what that process was when you started writing and interjecting your own personal stories into this character and was it sort of a cathartic process for you or how, how, how did it feel writing that? Yeah, bang on. It, it was definitely cathartic. It took a long time to sort of get the nerve to write it. In fact, when the book was published and it was, um, it sort of had this like global news sort of launch thing. That was the first time that most of the people in my private life even knew that I was dealing with anxiety disorders. Um, that's how secretive I had been growing up. And I had written the book initially for my 12 year old self in a sense uh, because I didn't even know what OCD was until I was 16 when I started having it on set around seven or eight. So for that long period of time, I was dealing with these compulsions, panic attacks, without even giving them a definition, without knowing that anyone else in the world was dealing with it. So OC Daniel was sort of my chance to go back and write for those kids. And, you know, gratifyingly enough, it has been sparking that. Kids are starting to realize what they're dealing with. It's opening dialogue. So that was really the main goal um, and, and that's been cathartic because it kind of gave a point to all of that stuff you dealt with when you're going back through it at that age. When, you know, being an author, you know, people are, uh, it's a profession people are naturally curious about. Uh, but when you kind of connect yourself to a cause like mental health, you know, you kind of have two different groups of maybe people, adventurous, um, approaching you. What has been the kind of, the feedback you've received from people whose lives have been touched by a mental illness read one of your books. Yeah, and you're so right. You know, you write a book and and you love to get those readers connecting with you and say, I, you know, I fell into the world, I escaped into this. But but having people connect that this made a positive impact on their mental health, it, it does hit on a different level. And it, it again, speaks to my own experiences, uh, which are still ongoing for, for those of us who deal with mental health. You know, you don't just, you know, flick a switch and it goes away and it, Sometimes it can be injurious to think that that's what's going to happen. Oh, if I just do this, I'll never have to deal with it again. That, you know, it can be a lifelong issue that can be mitigated and sort of managed. Um, but to have kids come up and say that I've finally been able to talk with my parents, I've finally been diagnosed, I finally have these tools in place, that makes such a big difference. And, you know, I was lucky enough to go speak to a lot of school boards and teachers across North America and sort of discuss with them about how they're reaching out to their kids as well. So now they've implemented these books in their curriculum. Um, because not just people who have mental illness, but how to deal with the people around you, how to be empathetic, how to be open. Uh, you know, adults have a lot to learn there. Never mind kids. Actually, I think kids might be inherently better at it sometimes <laughs> from what I see. Um, but hopefully everybody is sort of working on that now. What a, a strong theme throughout your books or a lot of your books is, is sort of this self-discovery and finding our own norms, right? Mm -hmm. um, I wonder what your advice is. So, I think a lot of kids on social media – are looking at sort of a fake environment and trying to create a normal based on that fake environment instead of seeing people that actually have flaws. You see this sort of candy-coated vision of what a person's supposed to be. And how do we encourage or what's your advice for young people to find and accept their normal in life? Great question. Yeah, and you're right. Like, you know, I know there, the statistics aren't quite clear. There's a lot of belief that maybe some of the rates of anxiety and depression are, are rising because of this idealized version we're getting of the people around us. Um, Cause you're right. Everybody's presenting their best selves and every one of us goes on our social media and thinks, oh, I wish I was on vacation, all this kind of stuff um, for kids, you know, and especially people dealing with, with mental health challenges, which so many of us are in some way or another um, that becomes dangerous. So for Sarah, she makes up this, this list of rules and they're basically just the things she sees in the people around her. And she's like, well, that person I think is normal, so I need to do that. And she's got like 135 of these to follow. It's growing constantly. And it's creating this unrealistic expectations for her. It's actually pushing her further and further away. It's secluding her because she feels further from normal. So the, as you said, the point of this book is sort of redefining what our normal is and finding what our healthy sort of representation is. Um, 
you know, and it's, it's good to have dialogue with kids too. And, you know, keep letting them know, you know, as you said, that the things that you're seeing in the world around you are, are candy coated, that everyone's not perfect and, and trying to find that flawed self. That's okay. That's sort of Sarah's journey here. My kids have decided that the first time they're going to vacuum is during one of these podcasts. So it's, uh, <laughs> hey, don't it, knock it. it. If they're doing yeah. some housework, you, you can't. That's, right. that. That's so a good thing. This is a <laughs> pandemic related issue that, you know, I can't, there's not much I can do about it now. So my apologies, but I don't know. when, when you look at what you've accomplished in terms of an author and you, know, you mentioned, you know, speaking to young people across North America, when you look back at your, you know, your own adolescence and what you were dealing with, how do you think you would have reacted to seeing something like this or being able to read something like this? Yeah, this, you know, and again, these, both of these books were designed almost again for that kid that, you know, that kid that I was that felt so isolated and alone, like the only crazy person in the world, they were designed to sort of give that kid some hope. O.C. Daniel about how we're not alone and Sarah in the search for normal, but how, how we can work on ourselves and sort of, you know, come to find our own version of normal and what's best for us. Um, so it would have been huge because, you know, as I said, when I was 12, 13, like an OC Daniel, I was doing five or six hour uh, repetitive sort of routines throughout the night, like, you know, these compulsions, this list of things, sometimes sleeping an hour or two, going to school for weeks on end, you know, brushing my teeth, thought I was spitting out blood, all of these things were going for hours and hours and hours and had no idea what was happening. A book that literally just told me that somebody else was going through this and it had a name would have made a tremendous impact on my life. So that was what we set out to do here. And then everything else that has come of it has been great, but that's really the central message. And, and it's great to hear, you know, your books are in schools. And I wonder, I saw you in an interview and I resonated with something you said because I found, and maybe it's changed a little bit, that school boards are still kind of reluctant to talk about mental illness. They're, they're okay if you come in and talk about mental wellness or resiliency, but there's this what if somebody in the, what, what if a student hears something and it'll, you know, they have a mental illness and it triggers them and I feel like, well, wouldn't you want to help that person? But do you find there's still a, a younger age education system a reluctance to have these conversations? There is, you know, I, the book that came out after O.C. Daniel, I was doing a tour of that and I got a, a letter from the principal of that school saying, can you please not talk about O.C. Daniel? Like it was a popular book at our school, but I prefer if you don't talk about it because we have our own way of dealing with mental health challenges. And I'm thinking, like, you know, this is a book based on my own experiences. It's a, it's a message of hope. You know, is it's not a good thing to bring up while I'm there if kids are curious. Uh, and you're right, there is reluctance. There was a lot of people who had pushed back and said there was, it was too raw. It was too real for this age group. You know, to which I always replied, well, it started for me at seven. Um, you know, so it started for me at that time. So why can't I talk about a kid who's dealing with it at the age of 12 now as it is in this book? So... I agree with you. I think there's, you know, it's almost like this, this funny thing, like, oh, if you talk to kids about it, maybe they'll start making up that they have it. Mm. And it's kind of like, you know, I would, if one kid makes up that he has it, but another one gets the treatment that he needs, well, I think that's a good trade off. And, and I think that's such a small percentage of what would possibly happen. Um, nobody who's dealt with mental illness um, would want to make it up, would want to pretend that they experience this. You know, it's, it's a lot of challenges to it. So I just, I agree with you. There's a bit of pushback. I hope it's changing. Maybe there's a bit more dialogue coming, but, but that's an example of where I was strictly told not to speak about my own book. It's funny because, you know, you'll see uh, other topics that are fairly, you know, adult coming in, whether it's drugs or drunk driving and things that are kind of, you know, but when it comes to mental health, it's like, no, just talk about wellness and resiliency and, and yeah, I feel like somehow we have to, if somebody identifies himself, shouldn't we want to know that and help them and, and set up the supports to help them? Because I'm sure this probably happened to you when you go and speak. There's that one kid that's kind of like, boy, this makes sense to me. This is my opportunity to talk to someone about this because I never felt like I knew what this was or I never felt like it was okay to actually talk about it. And you've made it okay to talk about it. Yeah, you know, there, you know, just kids reading The Hunger Games, which is about children killing each other. Um, <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> this story about mental health. And I, I get the idea of what they're saying, Trigger, but for me, I know I wanted to read what it was actually like. Because if it was glossed over, my simple response would be, well, I, always, I have it worse. You know, that obviously is not what I'm going through. So it was important to me to show how bad it can be and what it can feel like so that you can actually identify. Because 
you know, if we hear that he just thought, you know, he wasn't feeling good that day, you know, it doesn't, so, it doesn't connect in the same way. So I think it has to be really sort of raw and, and tough. And both of the books talk about some, some pretty hard stuff that, that unfortunately kids deal with. So that's just the way it is. Well, I, I think we're seeing today, you know, like, we're reluctant to draw parallels, but what's going on in the world today is all about having uncomfortable conversations, right? And uh, it's about not necessarily, uh, you know, the status quo and like if something makes you uncomfortable, don't walk away. Try to find out why it makes you uncomfortable. And uh, I think that's an example of that is we protect ourselves. Because if I start to ask you questions about your mental health and what you were doing as a child, it makes me uncomfortable as a parent. But that's, I think that's the place we got to get to. That's exactly right. You know, to give a great example of this. So I was hiding this, you know, my whole life. Um, doing a pretty good job, like an OC Daniel, of keeping the secret from my parents. And when I finally told my mom that I was dealing with OCD, she revealed that she had also been dealing with it. So there was this sort of, everyone was hiding it from each other. There was this sort of culture of secrecy. Because like you said, it's uncomfortable. It's not a happy thing to talk about. It's not like talking about sports. You know, it makes us uncomfortable. Um, but usually those are the conversations that need to be had. So, the, uh, I, sorry, go ahead, Chris. No, I was just gonna. I was try, trying to see if we could get an exclusive. So, is there any uh, any talk of uh, turning any of these books into TV, movies, anything in the works? Yeah. So, OC Daniel is uh, being worked on by Leland Productions right now. Uh, they've got a screenwriter who's uh, really sort of passionate about it, who's putting this together, and they're starting to put the the wheels in motion for an adaptation for OC Daniel film version. You, these days, you know, you try to a streaming service is, is sort of where you. No, but it, uh, it looks like, yeah, I mean, we're, we're certainly well on our way towards seeing O.C. Daniel get on the film. And hopefully if it does and it connects, well, then Sarah's story will be put up there as well. And I think, you know, I, based on what I've seen, the reaction of kids so far, I think if they put it out there, you know, they would connect and it would reach an even wider medium, which would be great for me. The more kids get the message. That's always sort of the goal, right? So. Was earlier in the, well, I guess before the pandemic, uh, you know, the world before, before the world was focused on coronavirus, there was about a month where we were focused on Kobe Bryant. <laughs> and um, I remember seeing that you actually had, you know, a working relationship with, with Kobe. So maybe tell us a little bit about uh, the work you did, but also about him as a, in your, as a person in your interaction. Yeah, we had 40 years of, of collaboration and, and, you know, almost daily. We were, it was constant phone calls and text messages. He was very, very involved. We wrote three books together and had plans to write, you know, endless more. He told me often he was going to keep me writing and, until my, uh, my dying days. There, he, We he had a ton of stories he wanted to tell. He wanted to keep the Wizard Art series going and sort of started out as a collaborator, became a friend and obviously was a mentor throughout as well. Um, and maybe not in the, the reasons that people think. He was a mentor because he was this sort of master of mindfulness. And he was very much in the moment. Um, and that was a big part of what he wanted to put into his gameplay and into his books. And so that was something I was trying to learn from him. Um, and, you know, that, that day, you know, that's sort of when the world sort of tilted on its axis for all of us and, and me as well. I was getting on a plane the next day to meet up with him and we were going to spend the week together working on books three, four, five. Um, we had brainstorming sessions planned all week. So, you know, and I found out by getting text messages because people thought I was already there, sort of, were you on the helicopter? Are you okay? And I had no idea what was going on. So it was a sort of horrendous way to figure out how this was all happening. Um, and it was a strange morning process. You know, it was a friend, but you could go to a grocery store without seeing his face. You couldn't turn on the TV without seeing his face. So I can't even imagine, you know, what the family had to go through, what these, you know, when they lose someone famous, that different sort of process of mourning. Um, and, and, you know, put me back into a bit of a dark place this year, which you know, coronavirus didn't help. Uh, but Kobe's mentality was, you know, get up and get back to it. So that was sort of eventually what I had to remember and, and get going again. So I wonder, working with them at first, I mean, uh, was, it, was it hard to kind of, you know, were you a bit starstruck? But then knowing Kobe and sort of being this renaissance man, was there anything you took from him that you've adapted to your life or your writing style or, or anything that you learned from Kobe? Yeah, a ton. Yeah. And I think, you know, I, I wasn't actually, we, we sort of started in sort of a funny way because I told him on our first phone call that I wasn't a fan of his because of his perennial beatdowns of the Toronto Raptors. Uh, <laughs> and so we sort of got that out of the way. And the, the first time I met him, I sort of, and now I look back and I laugh, but I show up in his like grand opulent office with like flip flops and a baseball cap and a softball shirt on. And we sort of had this casual relationship. 
And right away, he takes me down this sort of his wall of fame as he had it, where he put up portraits of people he admired in every avenue of life, from like Obama to J.K. Rowling to Steve Jobs, like everybody who sort of dominated their industry. And he had this great ambition, but he also had this, this sort of self-assurance, which I tried to learn from him. And it, it wasn't cockiness because he thought everybody could have the same self-assurance. He didn't actually place himself above. He just believed thoroughly that if you, you could will, these things didn't happening. And he, he believed that through his life and, and did it. He accomplished it. Um, so I tried to always put that in. You know, when I had low moments of writing, I'd, I'd call him, be like, Kobe, you know, this he's, and his response was always like, you're going to do it, man. You're a genius. Hype it up. You know, that's what he was. He was a hype man. He was like a professional hype man for everybody in his life. So I tried to take that a little bit. And, and it's hard to do. It's hard to keep the energy. You know, the guy slept like three hours a night and still was jumping off the walls. But the best that we can do and to hype the people around us, that's what I, I took a lot. So I think more in my personal life than my writing life is what I've learned from. It must be like just going back to like, you know, you mentioned the grieving process. Um, what, I mean, who's your friend? Yeah, I imagine part of you wants to keep his legacy going in your own, in your own way. How do you, like, how do you want to or try to honor him as you move kind of forward in your life and in your career? It's a great question. You know, right now the series has been paused. All creative outlets that he was working on have been paused. Um, you know, and it was always just like the family decides what's best for his legacy. We, we all just follow suit. You know, I, I didn't want to do anything without, you know, Vanessa's express permission, do this. This is what's best for Kobe's legacy. So I just waited for guidance and, and do so. But, you know, he, Kobe just, you know, again, he was a hype man. He thought he loved my books. He read uh, O.C. Daniel in an afternoon. He read a lot of my books right away. He was a big fan. So he just always believed to go out and keep doing more. He thought, you know, that I had a lot to share. And, and so I guess that's it. As I'm just trying to write and create and do these things and, you know, try and follow some of that mentality. But, you know, in terms of his legacy, it, it's the, the good news is at least he did get some of these books and these stories out in the world. And, and they're really sort of honest portrayals of what he believed. Um, he wanted to be remembered as a storyteller more than an athlete. And, and had he kept going, that might have well been the case because the guy had a whole library of books in his head. Um, I think we'll still remember him as an athlete because of the, obviously this incredible career. Maybe that would have always been the case. But he did get these stories in. And so his voice now lives on in this, in this way that he wanted it to as well. So. I think that's, you know, at least some, it's some consolation. You find consolation wherever you can sometimes. What about uh, you? Uh, obviously, you talked about the, the potential for the movie, but do you have any sort of long-time writing goals or any project that you're kind of on a bucket list that you'd like to address in the next 10, 15 years? Yeah, I mean, it was always just to write the next Harry Potter and, you know, live in a castle and, and you know, do that kind of <laughs> stuff. So that's how I started my career. That, that continues on. Um, you know, right now I've, I've, as I said, I've written three books on, on very sort of disparate topics. Um, one dealing with this sort of like a contemporary young adult book during the coronavirus, which will be coming out next year. Um, but I'm also writing again, more middle grade and more adventure stuff and getting back to sort of that, es that escapism too, which a lot of people need right now. So there's a bit of both going on. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just to keep writing sort of you know, those types of honest stories that I like to read. That's all I've ever done. Write a book that I like to read. Obviously, desperately, I, I do hope that O.C. Daniel continues to be shared and Sarah and Sister Normal continue to be shared. It's, it's crazy, like, the reaction around the world, too. You know, I get letters in different languages, which, you know, I put into Google Translate. No idea what they're saying half the time. But, you know, it, it connects with people all over the world because every, you know, mental health challenges are universal. All of us know somebody or are dealing with something. Um, so it's just to keep seeing that spread. And, again, hopefully it can get up on the screen and, and sort of spread the word a little bit more and, um, again, give kids that message of hope. This, if this is the series that sort of defines my career as a writer, well, that, that would be pretty great. Have you, I I just have you seen what... Uh, sorry. Oh, sorry. I, have you paid attention at all to what Mitch Album has done during the pandemic? Yes. So, I, so I'll explain it and then maybe get your thoughts on it. So um, Mitch Album's a, he's, well, he's a sports writer by trade, but he's written several uh, fiction and nonfiction books. And I think it was early on in the pandemic, he decided to write, and it's called Human Touch. So he's developing a novel, but he's releasing, he's releasing it as he goes. So every week, I believe, he releases a chapter, and it's on there for free. And then people give what they think, you know, that or what they can. And he's talked about how unique it is to try and get, a, you know, a chapter out every week, right? Just because, like, the, the way the creative yeah. process goes for you know for writers so i just wondered what 
you know, I wondered if you'd heard of it and what your kind of thoughts as an author were on that kind of uh, initiative. Yeah, I mean, I love the idea. And, and Eric Walters, another Canadian author, released already a middle grade book dealing with the coronavirus e-publishing. So e-publishing has opened up these doorways of this sort of quick turnover. Initially, I had set out to do sort of the same idea. Um, and then it just sort of developed into more of a story that we wanted to tell and craft for later. You know, it, it's, there's a really, a, you know, I wonder how much people are going to want to consume things about coronavirus sometimes, you know, because some of us want to put it behind us and yet it's going on. It's growing again. It's sort of, I think it's going to be, unfortunately, I hate to say it, but this sort of long-term issue that's going to define our world for a while. Um, and I know a lot of authors, their response was, well, just ignore it. I don't want to write about it. I don't want to read about it. But I think even now and then in the future, there's so many interesting things happening. Our social dynamics have changed so much. Our whole lives have just suddenly 180. You know, it's a pretty fascinating time to be alive. It's not, you know, it's maybe not the best time, but it's, it's certainly fascinating. So I think there's a lot to explore. Um, so I haven't actually gone through all, I, I did a bit of Mitch Albin, but I haven't, I'm, I'm interested to keep following along. I'll have to catch up with it again. Um, I mean, he's Mitch Albin. He can also do whatever he wants, so. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I just, thought, I just thought it was a really unique way to, uh, you know, to put out a book. And I would imagine. It was, yeah. And I imagine constraining to some degree because, you know, whether, regardless of what's going on that week, you've got to deliver. That's right, yeah. Chris, you're on mute. I just wanted to, uh, sorry, there's a plane flying overhead, so I'm trying to not interfere. Uh, I just wanted the world to know, because in, in O.C. Daniel, you're, he's kind of the backup kicker, backup athlete. I want the world to know that Wes actually has better hands than his brother Adam in football. So <laughs> let's put that out there. You're not a backbencher. You're not a... <laughs> the most important part of this interview yeah. so far. <laughs> <laughs> well, for people that don't know, Wes is originally from you know the Durham area, and his brother used to work in Ontario Shores, and your yes. sister-in-law is now back on Ontario Shores. Yes, that's right. Yeah, yes. Before I make sure Adam heard that that segment as well. <laughs> we got to make sure. We'll send that to him. Don't worry. <laughs> well, he's got, he's got the better arm, though. I'll give him that. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for your time. Uh, before you know, we kind of let you go. People want to. Um, read your new book or want to grab your new book, where do they go or any of your other uh, your previous ones when they find it? Yeah, so, you know, they're generally available wherever, wherever books are sold. I obviously love independent bookstores. I know there's not a ton in Durham region, unfortunately. Blue Heron Books in Uxbridge is, is awesome. Um, there's a few, if you can find your little independent bookstores, those are my favorite. Those are the ones to support. But of course, you know, Chapters in Indigo and all these places, like Costco has a bunch of my books as well. But uh, Independent ones first, then those ones, and you know, Amazon last. I order, I've ordered books off of Amazon, but you know, generally if you can buy them locally, that's amazing. So, uh, but you should be able to find them anywhere. Well, thank you very much for, yeah. for your time today and being so honest with your story and uh, keep writing and keep doing great work. Thanks, guys. I take care, Wes. Take care. Yeah,